Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to another live stream of The Left Lens. This is Danny Haifong, your host. And of course, I'm joined by Garland Nixon, host of The Garland Nixon Show over on YouTube and Rockfin. He's also the host of The Critical Hour. Good evening, Garland. How are you doing? Just wonderful. So we're waiting on Carl. Hopefully he's able to make it. Haven't been able to hear from him yet this evening, but hopefully he's able to come and and have a go of it and we can have a, a, a much larger discussion. But we have Garland here this evening now so we can begin in earnest. So let's before we begin, though, be sure, everyone, to hit that like button. Make sure that as you're coming into the stream, you're hitting the like button because that helps boost this stream. And of course, you should be subscribing to the channel if you're new here, hitting that notification bell also so you can get notified at least to the best of your ability. And be sure to go to the description and find all the great ways to support this show. The biggest and the best is patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. Now, let's get started, though, because we have a lot to cover. It's been quite the busy week. I think we should start, Garland, with this tweet of yours because it went viral. Uh, You tweeted about, it was satire, which you do very often, and I've heard you speak about this, where you talk about how if you thought Ukraine was bad, just wait until you see the plan of destruction for Taiwan. And you sent me an article I'll pull up, but I want to get your reaction to this tweet the, uh, the the story behind it, because it's gone viral, China, Taiwan, there's news stories about it seemingly each day. Garland, please, dis- please just give the audience here a picture of what happened. Yeah, so I tweeted, I do um, <clears throat> regular satirical tweets, and I'll say breaking news, and it usually goes something like this, breaking news, White House um, insiders leak that when asked about, and then I'll say something, and Joe Biden, or let's say Joe Biden re- re- responded, and then I'll have something, and it's something satirical, but sometimes it may say Kremlin insiders, CIA insiders, whatever, right, and I'll do that, leak that, and I'll come up with some satire. Well, this particular day, I put uh, White House insiders leak that when asked about if there could possibly be anything worse or any greater disaster than the Ukraine's neocon, the neocons Ukraine project, Joe Biden, President Biden responded, wait until you see our plan for destruction, for the destruction of Taiwan. <clears throat> well, apparently the Taiwan citizens of Taiwan who were legislators started retweeting that it went viral in Taiwan, it went viral in China, and news popped up everywhere. The, the Taiwan's like foreign minister or whoever went to the U.S. State Department and asked them if it was true. The Chinese started demanding a, uh, a response for the U.S. for the, the plan for the destruction of Taiwan. There were like these intellectuals. It was on all the news shows. There were like these intellectuals from various universities. I literally was watching this one and reading it, the one that was interpreted where this guy was saying, yes, that the President Biden probably has um, explosives set all over the island, and he probably has saboteurs already, so that as soon as he they he gives the go ahead, they can blow the island to smithereens, right? And that was about really. And as soon as I looked at it, I realized that was about Nord Stream. That when I said that that the people in that region looked at how the U.S. treated its allies and thought, well, it's only reasonable. I, I, it never dawned on me, but they thought it's only reasonable if Biden's blowing up Germany and all this stuff's going on in Ukraine. It only makes sense that it would add up that they do it to us, too. So that's why the tweet went viral and crazy, and that's why people believed it. And it, like, a couple of days ago, now this was over a week ago, a couple of days ago, I looked and it had, had like 150 million hits in one day. This was like a week and a half after it was tweeted. It has gone completely insane, but it's because it's, I never thought of it. It's reasonable for people to suspect that the Biden team's going to blow them to smithereens. They did it to Ukraine and their ostensible ally in Germany. Welcome, Carl. Thanks. Uh, well, that was a great introduction, Garland. We have Carl here on the stream. Welcome. How are you this morning for you? How are you? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. I'm mute. 
Um, hi. Hi, guys. Hi, uh, Danny. Hi, Garland. Hi. Uh, a great fan. Uh, Garland, I'm a great fan. I love your satiric tweet. Uh, but <laughs> in, in, in this day of age, sometimes it's hard to tell what is parody or not. <laughs> yeah. <that's... laughs> Carl, did you hear about that? I mean, did, have you heard about the whole hoopla over this thing? Um, so I was actually completely out. Um, I was playing Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas for the past three weeks. Okay. And I just logged back on Twitter like a few days ago. And wham, I was hit by like the wave <laughs> of anti-China rhetorics. Like yeah. I'm pretty familiar with anti-China rhetorics coming from mainstream media in U.S. But I was not prepared for like the speed and the ferocity of things that's been pumped out over the last three weeks, I've been I've been gone. I, and like, it's so ironic because the game I was playing, Fallout, for the people gamers out there, you know, Fallout is about the whole premise of the game is about post nuclear apocalyptic world after China and U.S. went to war against each other. <laughs> and here I am logging back on Twitter, and all the U.S. officials are talking about. China is going to start a war in 2025 or, or no, first they said um, that China is going to start a war in 2027. And now we, then we have a, a leaked Pentagon memo saying China is going to start a war with us in 2025. And then this is immediately after all that crazy weather bloom fiasco. And, and on top of that, we have uh, a CNN reporter in embedded on a U.S. spy plane flying on top of South China Sea. And he's wondering, why is that Chinese fighter jet flying so close to us? <laughs> I mean, like, you can't make this shit up. People, uh, you know, a lot of people, because people in U.S., people have busy lives. So we consume news passively, right? So so they, they might, oh, oh, my God, China is being aggressive again. But, you know, if you just... Think about it. You know, think for a second. This is a U.S. mainstream reporter inside a U.S. spy plane flying on top of South China Sea, wondering why the Chinese fighter plane are flying so close to them. It's like, it's duh. <laughs> and it, it's comedy. It's comedy. That's why I really appreciate your uh, the 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 the, com the 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 parody that you bring to us, uh, Garland. <laughs> I mean, this you. Uh, half of the time, you know, sometimes I will, I'm, I have to double check to make sure whether it's satire or it's real news. <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I will. Before you get into God, I want to just put in, I want to share the, you sent this today. We were looking at this right before we came on, Garland, about where has this gone since? I mean, this tweet is not necessarily recent in Twitter terms, I guess. It's relatively recent in real terms. But, uh, this Yahoo News article cites the tweet because, I mean, all of Chinese leadership has been asking about this, uh, maybe minus Xi Jinping, but you've had foreign ministry spokespeople ask about this. And now you have the foreign minister himself, Chin Gong, demand the United States explain its plans for the destruction of Taiwan. And then we can go down further into the article. Uh, while Chin did not give details of the plan, Garland Nixon, an American radio program host, said last month, that U.S. President Joe Biden had warned about the destruction of Taiwan. So I wanted to show that to let, to let everyone know that this has grown legs. And as you explained earlier, Garland, uh, people in Taiwan, Chinese people in Taiwan, and of course, uh, uh, people in China have also been asking about this. Uh, let me say, add this. You know, um, uh, um, I have friends, you know, friends that have, uh, you know, the people that I regularly interview and talk to about China, as you said, you know, KJ No and George Koo and various people. But what they've said was they've been, you know, talk to people who, you know, either are in Taiwan or, talk, or, or have connections. And they say that it, basically it opened a conversation about you know, you've got these people in Taiwan and they're not really thinking about if a war broke out, what would happen to us? And it opened a conversation there about, wait a minute, what would happen to us? We'd be blown to smithereens. We'd be at war between, we'd be the battleground for the war between two nuclear superpowers where, you know, where we get turned into Ukraine. So it created a conversation, a realistic conversation for people to think about Ukraine and, and the, the plan for destruction of Apparently, that conversation turned into kind of similar to Nord Stream, where they were saying, do they actually have 
bombs here. And then what started people started talking about was um, like a year old, the Pentagon had this um, had literally there were there are articles where the Pentagon said, well, if there were a war, we should blow up the TMS, TSMC's factory so that China couldn't get it. And so that whole conversation that they're being used as a pawn and that they could lose their lives, their property, their jobs and all that came out into the open, though it wasn't intentional. It's positive because sometimes a person needs to be shocked back to reality a little bit in order to make decisions that are in their own best interest. Well, Carl, could you talk about maybe following up on that? Talk about some of these latest developments with Taiwan. Maybe both of you could, because there's been a new military aid package, possible missiles F, uh, for F-16s, uh, and, and a lot more. McCarthy's visit, uh, the House Speaker, now the Republican Majority House Speaker, saying he was going to go to Taiwan. Now he's going to meet with Tsai Ing-wen in Washington. Could you go over a bit about the what's been happening in in the background that may lead to this kind of reaction both on the island of taiwan and in uh, broader china generally I, I wanted to point out you know all this talk about china threat threatening to invade taiwan in 2027 or 2025 this is all been in the english language media like in Chinese, you don't find anything. Like Chinese government is not making a, any statement about we're going to evade Taiwan. We must unify with Taiwan in the next five years or, or next, even ne they didn't even say even next 10 years. What Xi Jinping actually said was we're committed to peaceful unification with Taiwan. And and, and in the English media, is, is that's turned into... Xi Jinping is threatening to war, to go to war over Taiwan, which is, you know, it's really 1984. And 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 yes, uh, you know, McCarthy, we know what U.S. is trying to do. They're very disappointed that they did not provoke China into aggressive action after uh, Nancy Pelosi visit. And this is what U.S. is trying to do right now. Um, first of all, there's no... There was a Twitter space a couple of days ago hosted by some, uh, you know, NFT bro talking about U.S.-China war. I, I drop in to listen for a few minutes and I couldn't I couldn't stand it anymore because <laughs> these guys know nothing about China. They, they, they know nothing about the China-Taiwan situation. And uh, uh, they, they, they still think we're back in 1950, you know, like in the early part of the Cold War. Uh, that's that's where a lot of the American mindset is coming from. They don't realize what would mean if U.S. and China go to war today? It will be the end of the civilization as we know it. it, will, it, it nobody wins in a nuclear exchange. Let, let me just put it out there first. And you, China is not trying to start a war. Why? Because the time is on China's side. Every year, Chinese economy is growing bigger, stronger, and, 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 rel and relative to United States, China is, is gaining in strength year by year. So why would China rush in to do something in 2025 when in 2030, China will be even stronger than the United States? It does not make sense at all. It is the U.S. Pentagon, all the think tanks, now they're, they're circling the wagons. They're saying that we have a very small, limited time window to contain China because China is growing. If we allow China to grow in this current trajectory, China is going to surpass the United States in economic strength and military strength in not for uh, in foreseeable future, uh, not far, very far off. And that's why they think they have this limited time window between uh, <laughs> between five to ten years to do something about China's rise, to, to, to leverage the overwhelming uh, power of the current China, United States military might. Uh, and, and this is the thing. This is. United States is the one that's itching for confrontation. And, and that's why there have been insane level of provocation uh, for the last few years. You know, we, we've seen that with Nancy Pelosi's visit. Nancy Pelosi didn't visit Taiwan on his, her, her own private jet. She didn't even go on commercial jet. I, I don't think she ever go on commercial jet, but she went on U.S. Air Force jet, right? And, and she got a U.S. Air Force fighter escort to fly into Taiwan. And, and thankfully, China actually acted rationally. China did not shoot her down, <laughs> you know, did not give U.S. a cause 
for 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 wider war. So now you are just cranking up the provocation. It's as keep on escalating. Now now Nancy, after Nancy Pelosi is gone, now we're gonna have the new speaker going to Taiwan. We're just gonna try to see go China into doing something. You know, if they do something, then bang, we can we can hit them with with our might. And this is stupid <laughs> like well nobody's asking the american people why is this all necessary why do we even have to have a confrontational relationship with china everything was working uh you know after the nixon visit china in 1970s things has been going well for most part you know there, there's like up and downs but most part is peaceful but it's really in the last five years it's really wretching up the the, the war talk and, and we're in a very very dangerous territory here because um the the u.s military industrial complex you know for them it, everything is a game they, they talk up, up up the tension with china so they can justify the trillion dollars defense spending we continually pour into our defense industry and this includes the uh i forgot the figure i was thinking it was like 680 million uh, 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 uh dollars uh, arms deal they approved to to sell taiwan the thing is the arms deal is not doing what is they're, they're proposed to do they're saying we're shoring up defense of taiwan well then why are you selling them outdated weapons you know, U.S. never sell like the top of the line weapons to Taiwan. They give them the outdated weapons. Why? Because there's a fear in the Pentagon. All these weapons will end up in, in the in the hands of China a few years down the road. That's why. So so now it's really just we're just trying to squeeze as much as we can from Taiwan's uh, U.S. dollar currency reserve because U.S. is uh, Taiwan is one of those countries that have stockpiled uh, um, you know, U.S. dollar currency reserve from their, their trade surplus with U.S. So so now now it's all about grift, right? But they, they can't come out and say it in public. <laughs> it's all about making money for us to you know, kick back from our, our uh, uh, um, uh, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin buddies. They can't say that. They say, no, we have to defend democracy. We have to make a stand in the Pacific. United States must be the leader in, in Asia. A uh, U.S. ambassador actually to China actually came out and said that. US, China must recognize U.S. as a leader in Asia. Like, first of all, if you're a leader, you don't go around ask people, so like, you need to recognize me as a leader. You know, you, if you're a leader, you just lead. People follow. You don't have to go around people banning on the table and demanding people to recognize you as a leader. And the fact that why is U.S. wanting to be a leader all the way across the Pacific on the other side of the globe? You know, like why is U.S. devoting so much of its capital, its, 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 its diplomatic military muscles to be number one on the other side of the globe? It, it does not make sense. When, when there's so much that needs to be done within the United States right now, we just have that big chemical spill in Ohio, East Palestine, right? I mean, that should be the biggest news. If that had happened in China, all the mainstream news will be reporting on it 24-7. Yeah. There right? would be but, heads but, rolling. There would be heads there would be go uh, there would be a lot of replacements in the government. Yeah, too. And, and and they actually arrested a reporter on the scene. I mean, can you imagine the level of rhetoric that coming to for mainstream media if something happened in China, but but this is the United States, so we kind of just pretend oh, this is ever, this is just normal. This is this is normal. You know, we we have the worst, probably one of the worst chemical incident in in decades, and and they arrest their reporter, and this is just normal. We should just accept it. This and it happened crazy. again too in Springfield, Ohio, just a few days ago, and that there's been even less news coverage on that but garland i don't know if you want to follow or carl did you finish i, I don't know if you finished uh, it just one, one more thing so, gotcha. and right now you know we are also engaged in this proxy war in ukraine against russia you know we're fighting russian to the last ukrainians and th things are not going well in the ukrainian war so what we do we go to the so-called european ally you know our vassal states and asking them to come up with a plan to sanction china for possible for Chinese possible aids to Russia. It's like China, first of all, China has not supplied Russia with weapons, but US is all, always acting like China is and is already drafting a plan with the European allies to, to, to sanction China. When 
like, look, can we just wrap up one co conflict at a time? Like, w this is crazy. Like, for them, it's uh, this is just media manipulation, right? It's, of course, P they want to really distract the public from the bombshell that Seymour Hersh dropped about U.S. involvement in blowing up Nord Stream 2, right? That's a real news. And, 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 and the fact that there was a big bit worse chemical spill incident in U U.S. history in Ohio. But instead, well, let's talk about Chinese balloons. Let's talk about Chinese Chinese Cranes. fighters that flying close to our spy plane in, in South China Sea. Let's 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 talk about uh, blowing up Taiwan so China cannot have Taiwan's semiconductor industry. This is crazy. Like I, I you know I when I was living in U.S. a few years back, so, you know, like it just. I think because I was in that environment, like it, it just, you kind of accept it. Okay, United States is crazy. Now I live outside the country for a few years. I look back and look in. It's U.S. is crazy. <laughs> we have crazies in charge here. What's going on? You know, maybe you guys can explain to me what's going on here. <laughs> well, you know, I think in a, a, a Carl kind of hit the, the the nail on the head here when he said the crazies are in charge. The, what, because what's happening is irrational. So to a rational person, we look at it and we say, this doesn't make sense. And it, to me, they are the, 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 they are very, very desperate because the ruling elite in this class know that our system of capitalism, this predatory neoliberal capitalism, a predator needs prey, a parasite needs a host. And they know that they're having problems now because Russia and China and some of the other countries are able to compete with them in Africa, in South America for the precious minerals and various things that they need that they traditionally Traditionally, preyed on these weaker countries and simply took their resources and overthrew the, through their governments. Now they're unable to do that anymore. Now the U.S. empire is unable to prey on anybody they want around the world because there are other people who can offer alternatives, China, Russia, etc. And they're desperate and they're irrational and they don't know what to do. And so now they're saying the rules based order, you're violating the rules based order. And what in fact is the rules based order? Because there's a rules-based order, but nobody can find the rules and they can't direct us to it. And what my interpretation of the rules-based order is quite simple. It's, a, it's an international feudalism. They're saying that this is a hierarchical system and we're at the top. We are the, nobil the class of nobility. The commoners would be, I guess, the Europeans and everybody else is the peasants. And we're trying to maintain this international feudalism where we have the prerogative to do anything we want around the world but the peasants and what have you can only do what we tell them. And that's the order. They can't come out and say that the rules are the rules of feudalism. Now, the, the so-called peasants, China, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America are all saying, well, you know, we don't have to go by your rules anymore and we're not going to. And they are being irrational. They don't know how to deal with that. Internally, when we say, well, how come they're not dealing with the internal issues? Because they are so upset and desperate that... To, they're afraid that their predatory capitalism is going to fall apart and they'll lose everything. And so they're reaching in all different directions. I mean, you, you, one of the things you mentioned, they are stuck. They are trapped in the Ukraine conflict. They've got a tiger by the tail, as they say. They can't let go and they can't hold on. They have no idea how to get out of it. They're living, they're just making up one narrative after the other. Now they're saying, yes, the Russians are literally, literally, they're saying they're fighting with shovels. Have you seen that? They literally said, yes, they're throwing human waves and fighting with shovels. Well, you know what? It sounds good if that were true. The problem they have is these narratives are untrue. And all they have left now is the narratives that they can feed to the people internally. As Carl said, externally, people are looking at them and saying, these people are out of their minds. They're blind ideologues. And internally, they keep feeding the narratives. The problem they have is two things. Number one, the Ukraine conflict is not going their way and never will. Number two, they don't have till 2025, 27. They have, in my opinion, until the next a Taiwan election. And when that happens, the KMT is going to win. It appears, unless something dramatic changes. When that happens, they're not going to have their quizzling government in Taiwan and they lose what little argument they have for Taiwan independence or whatever. 
I think that's why they're making so much noise on the Korean Peninsula now, because they're like, oh, if we don't get something going here in time, that's kind of falling apart. I know we'll stir up trouble in North Korea and we'll try to use that. They're they're desperate to do anything they can. So we're just looking at desperate people. I put I, I always say they're kind of like a man who falls in the water that doesn't know how to swim. He's desperately grabbing in every direction for anything he can grab to pull himself out of, but he can't get his hands on anything. And they are, they don't know what to do. Let me add this. Look at their Israeli project. That's coming unglued. The Israeli government now is, I mean, literally, they're like madmen there. They're they're flipping out. They're threatening Taiwan. They literally, in Israel, if people haven't been following it, you have members of the Israeli Air Force saying, we are not going to report to duty because we're angry because of internal political problems in Israel. So everything in all directions is falling apart for these people and they don't know what to do. And they're just the situation here is uh, politically collapsing. Mm. Well, before I, I kick it back to you, Carl, I, I mean, those are great points that all of you made. And I, I think it, it might be good to talk about what just happened there's this con there there's this confluence of events that you all are speaking about and there's two i, I would like your reaction on the first is there is a media firestorm there was first the like the spy cranes incident that i covered last night i mean this is happening so rapidly as you said carl earlier that it's almost like it's hard to keep up and then china just finished its two sessions and it made certain uh uh, promises set certain goals right five percent gdp growth for 2023 seven about seven percent military uh incre an increase in military spending and all across the media today all day washington post new york times there were a few quotes that were very scary to the establishment i want to pull up one uh and this was from uh, uh xi jinping he made this statement today. Let me see if I can find which one is it. Um, oh, it looks like I don't have it. Uh, I thought it was up. Well, he said that uh, the United China is going through many challenges internationally because the U.S. has suppressed and tried to contain and has uh, and really waged war upon China, has really uh, tried to contain China. And so, you know, China, China is very aware of this and it's in its facing headwinds, et cetera. That really scared. And then Chen Gong also said the United States, if it they're, they're, they're you know, uh, uh, proliferating conflict. Well, you know, if that's how it's going to be, we're going it's not acceptable for us not to respond. And all across the media it was, well, China wants a conflict with the United States. I want your reaction on this because. The two sessions was ignored mainly or dismissed in the Western mainstream media, the collective West media. But at the same time that this was happening, there's another development. Today, we've heard New York Times report that U.S. intelligence says that uh, a, a, a Ukrainian group, a pro-Ukraine group, blew up Nord Stream. This is just after Olaf Schultz walked out of D.C. with his tail between his legs. So... I just want your reactions on these events because I feel like they're very related and, you know, they really speak to this level of desperation that you two were talking about earlier. Carl, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, this right now, like Garland said, this uh, I think it's a, the, the media environment is a reflection of cop copium plus deflection. Right. The copium is like we're doing fine <laughs> when the house is burning down. We're doing fine. And and the, the, the deflection is deflecting from the real fa failures of the U.S. policy and, and what U.S. is doing to provoke Russia and then to provoke China and, and then to shift the blame on the others. Right. So what Xi Jinping said was actually common sense. That's that's for everyone can see us is trying to put together a containment strategy on china not just this is not just what people observe this is what us officials are publicly saying we are now trying to contain china right and and so there's nothing wrong with this is factually it's 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 correct now this, it's it's pretty unprecedented in one way is because 
uh, Chinese lead, leader before never really communicated to the Chinese people in such stark terms. And, you know, unlike our media, who has been preparing U U.S. population for war for a while now, you know, Ch Ch Chinese leaders haven't been telling uh, the Chinese people it's like, okay, the the relationship have been going pretty bad, and then uh, you know we need to prepare for war <laughs> like that. That's they they have not done that. So this is pretty unprecedented when Xi Jinping is directly speaking to the Chinese people, telling them that now you the, the, the collective West headed by U.S. is trying to contain China. So we probably should prepare for hard time ahead. And, and factually, what he said was was correct. And, and, and the fact that the, the again, it's, it's part of the deflection that U.S. media is focusing on what he's saying rather than what prompt him to say it and 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 then this is um it, it's like for the u.s politicians and the pundits it's all a game for them they 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 they, they, they appear tough on china tough on russia right and, and they know the end result is they're gonna get more fat kickback from their buddies in boeing in lockheed martin in raytheon who is gonna get increasing orders it's all a very corrupt, very, uh, very corrupt game for them. But Chinese leaders, they listen and they watch, right? Confucius says, you know, you listen to one's words, but watch one's action. They can see that U.S. have been escalating, um, is climbing a, a ladder of escalation in terms of provocations. They, 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 they take it seriously. I mean. Maybe for the, the pundits, it's just a it's a very corrupt game to to for to get, make more money for themselves. But but the Chinese leader takes these threats uttered by U.S. public figures, you know, including U.S. officials, U.S. congressmen. Chinese leader takes that seriously. That's why they're taking action. That's why they're increasing their defense budget to seven point. 7%, you know, there's a 7% increase in the, in the China. And, and even with a 7% increase in the Chinese defense budget, it's still far, far below, you know, the, 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 the you know, per percentage of GDP, what U, U.S. spends on its defense. Right. It, it's, it's about half control. of what the U.S. It's about yeah, half well, of what the U. I think China spends 1.7% of its GDP on the military in the United States somewhere between three to 3.5 percent so nearly double u.s spends more on military th uh, than china russia combined you know and and, and this is this, it's great and, and when i say spending on military i maybe i should qualify they're not spending money on like veterans welfare right they're not spending money on on, on that they're spending money on very expensive weapon system that doesn't even work like f-35 you know, the F-35 is not supposed to work. It, it's just supposed to, you know, suck money out of the taxpayers and transfer into the pockets of of the of the weapon manufacturers. That's that it's it's a very crooked game. But again, like I said, the, for for US pundits, US politicians, it's all a game for them. But you know, when the Chinese people hear Chinese leaders hear the threat from supposedly u.s leaders or u.s thought leaders they take it seriously i mean who, who can blame them <laughs> given the amount of the provocation that u.s have been carrying out against china um you know why why wouldn't they be prepared and the before i get to you Garl, i just want to read this quote uh arnaud bertrand said that he quoted from the wall street journal this was what xi jinping had to say western countries led by the u.s have implemented all around containment encirclement and suppression against us bringing unprecedentedly severe challenges to our country's development. Anyway, Garland, just want to kick it back to and you. And I would argue that's a fairly practical statement. It's a fairly muted statement. It doesn't say we're, we are we got to bomb them or attack them. It just says, hey, we got some challenges ahead and we have to pre prepare for challenges. I, a couple of things I'll throw out. Number one, <clears throat> one could argue that China is spending more on defense than us because what they're spending is on defense. Think about this. We got 850 bases, mm. that $850 million, right? We got all of these bases in the Middle East, in um, the bases, uh, AFRICOM, bases all over South America. If you start off by just taking the amount of money off the top that it takes to maintain the bases that we have all over the world, eh, 
I bet you you got over 50% of the budget there. Then, a, what, 12, 14 aircraft carrier groups, right? If you look at the money it takes to maintain this um, imperial power projection thing that we have, by the time you get to the actual dollars and cents that we would have to fight a war, also keeping in mind what Carl is saying, and that is that when Raytheon makes a missile, they don't make a missile as a strike uh, weapon. They make a missile as a product to get as much money as they can. We've even seen in Ukraine a number of the things that haven't worked as well as they thought they would because they weren't made to be weapons. They were made to create a... Um, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to create a profit. So when China makes a tank, they make a tank. The government owns it. There's no profit. There's no games played. There's a tank. I was uh, watching... Uh, um, looking at some numbers, I forgot words, but I was looking at some numbers where like these ships that we were making, that Russia could make three and a half to four for every one that we made because the government basically built its own ships and we built these ships with these incredible amounts of, you know, ours was 70% profit. So from the perspective of finances, um, I didn't see it. You guys look out for it. I was told by a very reliable person today that there was an article in the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the hard version, not online, that said the U.S. is in no way prepared for war with China, which is true. If you look at those these like uh, CSIS war games, they're like, yes, in the first week, this would happen. And you're like, OK, well, that ain't all right. well, what would happen in the second week, huh? Second week, there's a second because that's what happened in Ukraine. We're going to do this. All right. Russia's been uh, in wars for a long, long time. They've been in. You know, they've spent many, many years in Syria. They ain't going nowhere. So now six, eight months down the, down the line, what's happening in Ukraine? Oh, crap. We're running out of stuff. We didn't think about it lasting that long. The U.S. is not prepared. And, and as, I, as I was saying earlier, and I've said this, if you said to me, Garland, you got to fight this guy right here by next Thursday, Right. This guy's if you if you wait till after Thursday, if, if you fight him anytime after Thursday, you'll probably win up to Thursday. It's a draw. I'm going to wait till after Thursday to fight him. I would fight him the, because I know if I wait till after Thursday, I'm probably going to win. In fact, I'm going to wait 10 Thursdays where I know I can win. So if the concept is we've got to fight China now, because if we wait till later, we'll beat him. China's going to be like, duh. OK, we'll fight you in 15 years. And then we won't have to fight you. It only makes common sense. So China knows, as uh, and I've been saying this all along, China knows that time is on their side. They know that all they got to do is drag this thing out. I think also, I mean, I don't, I, I'm opposed to war. I don't like war anywhere, right? But it is what it is. This Ukraine conflict is going in. It, it, uh, the U.S., they got one foot in a tar put, put pit. Let me tell you, when you get one foot in a tar pit, you might as well have all your feet in a tar pit. You're going down in the tar sooner or later. So they've got one foot in a Ukraine tar pit. All China has to do is stand over there and watch them because the more they struggle, the deeper they go down in the tar pit. As when you look at their so-called allies, their vassals in Europe, what's going on? People are in the streets. People are getting angrier. People are getting upset. They're starting to say, wait a minute, this doesn't work for me. The U.S. is on our side. What's going on here? The I would bet you, Olaf Schultz, I don't think much of him, but I would bet that there are some rumblings from European leaders saying, I don't know how much we, longer we can hold on because the guillotines are being sharpened in the streets and these people are not going to put up with this much longer. So Russia, all they have to do is just all China and Russia have to do is just keep doing what they're doing, slow and easy. Time is on their side. The U.S. is in a rush. The U.S. is in desperation. 2024 is coming. So Biden's going to get freaked out by that pretty soon. And the, and the parties are going to be trying to deal with that. Here we've got Lindsey Graham literally saying now we should attack Mexico. Have you seen that? Look it up. Lindsey Graham is saying, yes, some Americans were killed in Mexico. We, we might have to take military, use military force in Mexico. And I'm thinking, well, then I guess the Russians will start sending tanks to Mexico because if it's okay, well, good for the goose, good for the gander. I wanted to just uh, before uh, we move on, you mentioned this article, Garland. I found it. Um, and this is what it's titled. The U.S. is not ready for the era of great power conflict since 2018. The military has shifted to focus on China and Russia after decades of fighting insurgencies, but it still faces challenges to produce weapons and come up with new ways of waging war. But 
the interesting thing for me is the author of this article, Michael Gordon, who with Judith Miller during the pre-Iraq invasion was the reporter that uh, supposedly broke the weapons of mass destruction story, ended up being falsified intelligence, i.e. lies. And so this is my, oops, sorry, this is Michael Gordon. This is that guy talking about this. This is how, as you talk about Black Garland, this is how the neocons are. They're, they're all in a big club and they're all saying the same things and they, they're keeping their uh, re- their ear to the ground on these issues. But anyway, I'll, uh, I'll stop there and pass it on back to Carl. I, I was going to point out the same thing. The same Michael R. Gordon was also wrote the Wall Street Journal exclusive on the the so-called lab leak uh, theory. Who who you know recent on the recent um, Department of Energy report, low confidence report. You know, I, I, and I just, <laughs> what the hell is low confidence report anyway? I mean, they had pretty high confidence when they said Iraq had ma- weapons of mass destruction, right? And, and, and it was also Department of Energy, let's not forget, that put out that report that Saddam was trying to purchase uranium cake from Niger. And it was also reported by Michael R. Gordon. You know, it's the same tool for the empire. And, and, and even that article that when he says U.S. is not ready for a, a great power a great um, power conflict, he's advocating basically increased defense spending of course. in U.S. to purchase more weapon platforms. Uh, but, but on that note, on that note, I, I agree. I agree with what Garland said. I actually agree U.S. is not ready because even from, especially from listening to that talk on U.S.-China war, oh my God, people are so ignorant, and 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 people still act like um, if China is going to have a war with, uh, you know, cross the Taiwan Strait, all U.S. have to do is send its carrier groups and park it inside the Taiwan Strait. That would be suicidal. I mean, even U.S. military knew that this is not 1950 anymore. In the 1950, Eisenhower, uh, not Eisenhower, sorry, Truman authorized U.S. 7th Fleet to send its aircraft carrier fleet groups into the Taiwan Strait to prevent Mao's People's Liberation Army from cross to 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 defeat Chiang Kai-shek on Taiwan. That happened because China in PRC in 1950 did not have a Navy. They didn't have an Air Force. Today, they have missiles on mainland that cover the entire range of the Taiwan Strait. Any US ship sailing in in, in time of war, there will be sitting target. You, Taiwan Strait will be a kill zone. The US military actually knew this. If you if you notice, right now, the US sometimes will send one long ship to do like a freedom of navigation through Taiwan Strait. But the carrier group largely stay off, <laughs> stay away from the Taiwan Strait because they know it will be dangerous. You know, like that's that's literally will be literally killed. I mean, I don't want a war. You know, I definitely do not want a war. Um, uh, you know, break out over Taiwan. But but the, the way that people were talking about it was so stupid that they, it, I have to point out. Like people are saying, oh, but you don't know how ta- mountainous Taiwan is. You know, perfect place for guerrilla warfare. Look. Look, look, yes, you can look at a map and say Taiwan is very mountainous. That's why majority of Taiwan population is crammed into this coastal plain facing mainland China. You know, the moment that you have to go into the mountains, that means it's lost. Everything is lost. You know, and, you know, guess who live in the mountains? Indigenous Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese tribes. You know, who, who are not necessarily a fan of the current Taiwan government. Now, I would bet my top dollars if the if the Taiwan government official flee into the mountains, the indigenous people would just turn them over to the PLA. And then, like that, that's most likely what would happen. And, and so people will keep still making the assumption that okay, China is gonna fire the first shot, US is gonna come in as the you know the white knight, you know, like. Like come to rescue, but if a war breaks out, I, I don't. I'm not saying it is, and I'm. Not, I do not advocate war. But most likely scenario is China will put put a naval blockade around Taiwan because Taiwan is an island, right? And once you have a naval blockade, you know it's no longer a situation like Ukraine where you can have a proxy wolf warfare and fight fight Russians to the last Ukrainians because. Taiwan is an island. If it's a naval blockade, it's over. 
and you you know you then what would us do sending the sending the seventh fleet you know if you send seventh fleet in to break the naval blockade then it's war then it's a direct war between two nuclear powers between china and us all that ensues you know like what happens when china sinks a us aircraft carrier you know like the, the us pentagon uh, or generals have said you know if that happens it will use nuclear weapon well guess what once you go nuclear there's you're not coming back there's no coming back from nuclear weapons there's no de-escalation ladder from nuclear exchange you, you only go from tactical nuclear weapon to strategic nuclear weapons that's the only way it's going to go and everything is going to be over in, in half hour you know the, the you know all the uh, next you know you know i right i was playing Fallout Two, Fallout Three, the game. By then, we all be live action role playing <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> nuclear apocalyptic world. I mean, this is very serious, and, and but people are still talking about it very like nonchalantly, right? In the U.S. media, they still think this is some some kind of imperial game they can play. This is this is life and death, man. <laughs> this is very real, and but 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 the, the sad thing is. It's uh, they these 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 uh, mouse pieces for Pentagon for 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 Raytheon for Boeing they have so dominated our airwaves our our, our media platform we're not even giving the, the U.S. public a chance to discuss why is it necessary for us to have a confrontational relationship with China why can't we just trade <laughs> it's a very simple question nobody's asking that because. Uh, like Garland said, that the U.S. elite is in panic mode right now. You know, uh, I, I like the analogy that you made, Garland, about like they think everything is a feudal hierarchy. But I like to point it out: not only they treat everyone outside U.S. as peasant, they 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 obviously don't treat the U.S. working people as part of the nobility. <laughs> we are all <laughs> peasants to them. No, they're <laughs> the labor aristocracy, long, long gone if it really ever existed. They, they, they treat us as peasants too. Like like all three of us, all, we all pay taxes to the United States government, but we have no say in the freaking very important decision whether this country is going to commit itself to a nuclear exchange with a nuclear power. This is crazy, man. And something something is wrong with this picture. Well, <laughs> okay, Gar- I- oh, sorry. sorry. I just wanted to get your reaction, Garland, to the uh, uh, report that came out today about U.S. intelligence saying that it was a pro-Ukrainian group that blew up Nord Stream because I think it's very related to everything that we've been talking about up until this point. But I want your reaction to this, what you think about it, and uh, wherever else you want to go with that, because I, I, it, it just, it was, I could only think of the clown emoji when I saw that headline pop up and, and it was really difficult for me to even open it because it just felt, it just felt wrong that that this story even exists after everything Seymour Hirsch re, uh, uh, reported on. And then the silence from the United States, from the NATO collective West, and you even had Olaf Schultz come all the way to DC. And they didn't speak to one reporter while here. Garland, what's your take? You know, it just goes to far shows the farcical nature of the narratives that are put forth by the U.S. Um, ruling elite. Now, the, I mean, the reality is they're kind of in a corner. They know it's like I know that you know that I know. You know the old joke. Everybody knows that they did it. Um, they're in a bind in the UN. I think this is about the UN Security Council because they're in a bind in the UN because Russia won't back off and China and other countries are saying, Hungary, other countries are saying, well, I think we need an investigation. And they tried to argue, well, there's been an investigation by you know Sweden or whoever, and then, but they won't release their info. So I think this is a way to do, address the UN Security Council to try to say, well, you know, believe it or not, there was five guys in a sailboat. I think they actually said they found a sailboat or something. So now we're supposed to believe that the most heavily patrolled waters on earth, five schmucks in a sailboat or something, sailed out there, went like 180 meters down with a thousand kilograms of plastic, drilled through uh, you know, a, a concrete barrier, and then uh used a, a you know a sonar buoy. It, it gets it doesn't get any preposterous. But again, when you're that desperate. 
they got to say something. They just can't say we did it or we didn't do it. So no matter how preposterous, they had to come up with a story. So if you're going to come up with a preposterous story, why not make it really out there? So it's just like something to cling to. I think that um, what, one of the things that I'm keeping my eye on, and that is the upcoming meeting between Xi Jinping and um, and 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 um, Vladimir Putin. Um, you know, there's all this talk. Will they sign a military alliance? You know, um, I don't think they. It, I, I'll put it like this: It wouldn't shock me if they do the military mutual defense pact. I, they don't have to at this point. They don't need to. They're both capable of defending themselves. They may. I can. I can make an argument for it. But I. I. I think the mystique of their upcoming meeting is enough to you know freak out their adversaries and to kind of get the point across so that's something that i'm really keeping an eye on but this story it's just something to laugh at and to demonstrate again to, to the world that you know this thing has gotten really really silly and um they don't know how to address the reality going on in the un what do they do if you what do you they just do because if the us and uk just try to kill it or just say we're, we're going to um veto this thing well wait a minute you say that Article 5 is important and you've got to protect these countries from attack. And now one of them has been attacked. And the UN, the outsiders, the evil Russians and Chinese are all saying, well, let's do a, 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 an international investigation. And you're like, now nah, we're going to veto that. Wouldn't want that to happen. You might as well just stand up and, and, and do a videotaped confession. So they got to have something no matter how weak. That's what this is about. This is about the UNSC. This is about the call for international investigations. And even they don't, they don't have much, they'll put forward, I think literally it was on RT or something that they said they found a sailboat or something like that. I mean, like somebody can just sail a sailboat out into the Baltic Sea with this stuff. And uh, let me see if I see it. Uh, investigators find vessel involved in Nord Stream sabotage. Uh uh, they said a yacht sailed from the German port of something with the explosives, a thousand pounds or rather a thousand kilograms of explosives. Somebody just sailed out there on like a, you know, a 38 foot motor cruiser or something. It's preposterous. But what else are they going to do? And then they dove into the Baltic Sea and precisely placed these thousand, <laughs> these explosives. A thousand kilograms on, of explosives. A thousand, so they dove down there on their own in a yacht in order to blow up Nord Stream. Plus, it wasn't blown up exactly as they were placed, as Seymour Hirsch has revealed. That definitely didn't happen. It took some time. There was deliberations about it, obviously. So not only this, this pro-Ukrainian group sailing on this yacht, they had this master plan. They weren't helped by anybody. It was just uh, it was just Ukraine. And, and some have speculated that there may be some uh, control going on around the Ukrainian government an attempt to say, well, we're going to place the blame a little bit on them in order to rein them in a bit so they know that they're not so untouchable, that they can be blamed for this big catastrophe and they'll just have to take it because that's what the status of the well, Ukraine the, government. It's a vassal of the United States. It's a vassal of NATO. It's nothing more. It's worse than a vassal. It's a puppet. Well, the really interesting thing about this yacht is it was completely stealth because that part of the ocean is covered by radar and satellite. So somehow <laughs> this yacht that did that was able to evade satellites and yachts. I mean, I put it like this. Whoever did that needs to sell that to the U.S. or Russia or China. Anytime you can take a motor yacht and you can evade satellites, you can evade <laughs> all of the uh, radar from the, the, the most sophisticated radar on Earth. You can evade all of that and go right out to the uh, to the to to. And uh, here's the other thing. And you've got a map of exactly where the points are you want to hit. You know, I mean, let, let's not be. Uh, you know, absurd here. But what else are they going to do? They can't just go to the UNSC and say, yeah, we did it, but we don't want an investigation, which is essentially what they're doing with this story. Any reactions, Carl? Well, what can I say? I mean, to, to say, to think that they, they're trying to convince us that Ukraine has this powerful, sophisticated Navy that could infiltrate the NATO waters to blow up the important infrastructure for Germany. And this is like Garden said, this is absurd. <laughs> I mean, this is like, even if, 
even if there's Ukrainian participation, there's no way they could have no done it way. without U.S. help, right? I mean, maybe they had people like Ukrainian personnel, you know, go, went in, did the diving, you know. But like like Garland said, all the coordination, targeting, evading surveillance. You can't oh, two divers. It says there were. It says there were six people that did it, and it said there was. A female doctor, uh, a, a two divers, two doctor, two divers. Man, these guys were strong. What they carried five hundred kilograms each. <laughs> and they must have been the Hulk, the Hulk and She Hulk. They were superheroes, and they literally flew down there, each of them carrying five hundred kilograms. And how did they get through the concrete? I don't know, but you know, I mean, hey, they're your superheroes. Wow. It's just what you do. And it's getting more absurd the propaganda because it's like. We had just the day before we had Chinese spy cranes, right? Cranes in in U.S. ports that are were pr manufactured in China, spying on the United States. Now, oh, no evidence of that. Now you have a ragtag group of pro -U pro Ukrainian forces. We don't know who they are diving with all of this ex all of this explosives on their back from a yacht, and then. This just adds on to how absurd. I mean, this is over the years, right? We had weapons of mass destruction. Our our uh, uh, good friend Michael R. Gordon that we just talked about, uh, uh, you know, uh, leaking intelligence that was all lies anyway, right? It was all weapons of mass destruction. Iraq supposedly had it, didn't have it. Then you had the Libya debacle. You had Libya, right? Libya was giving Viagra to their troops and uh, using it against women and children in libya of course that did not happen syria right syrian government uses chemical weapons on its own people even though it's winning a war it uses chemical weapons anyway of course that did not happen that's not how it happened but now it feels like it just gets more and more absurd we had russia gate now we have this now we have all the propaganda around the ukraine conflict and now it just all, around russia and china it's like there's so much hysteria and fear it's like cold war 2.0 that they can't help but try to cover their bases, especially with all of the silence around the Nord Stream revelation from Seymour Hersh. It's obvious that the neocon establishment, the foreign policy establishment, the U.S. and it, it's obvious that they're very concerned about that information if they're willing to release something as like this, which is so absurd. There's there's definitely something that they're trying to uh, you know deflect from that because, like you point out, first it was... Just in the span of three, four weeks, you have the Chinese bloom incident. You have the lab leak, you know, so supposedly the intelligence about the lab leak. And then you have the supposedly Chinese spike crane. I mean, this happened in a very short amount of time. Like the only explanation I can ha I can give right now is, is that they're really desperately trying to deflect, uh, distract the public from, 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 from the real scandal that was the U.S. attack on cr critical infrastructure of Germany, Nord Stream, Nord Stream Two, and 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 but 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 which, if you think about it, is crazy in its own way because okay, so they want to deflect the public opinion from that. Instead, we're just going to provoke China endlessly to go with these stories. You know, I, Chinese people are patient, but you know, <laughs> the patience has its limit. <laughs> What's all these like? Like uh, xenophobic, uh, 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 like fear mongering, going to lead to. I mean, I, 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 I'm so glad I'm not in the United States right now. I mean, I ended up in Indonesia purely by chance because I came here to surf and I love it so much. I ended up staying. Uh, um, and but 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 now I'm so glad I am not in U.S. Right? Just because I have a Chinese face, I have a Chinese name. You know, I am wearing the face of the official enemy right now. So shit, man. I, it's like I I don't even want to bring my family to visit the U.S. right now. Like I, you know, my parents are still back in U.S. I, I now I hesitate to bring my 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 family to to come back and visit, given the current media environment in U.S. Well, India's next. 
And India knows it. That's why India is has has um, from the very beginning. That's why India has joined Russia and, and China because they recognize that any power that aspires, to, any country that aspires to be a world power, will be in the crosshairs of the neocons. And so, India. The next thing you'll know is it'll be Indian spy balloons and Indian cranes and Indian, you know, whatever that's out to get us. These people are just they they're they're jumping from you know, one enemy to the next, and they don't know what to do. And I, but I suspect, you know, I did a video on my YouTube a while back and it was, will, I don't remember exactly, but I said something like, will Vladimir Putin save the world? And what I meant was this, Vladimir Putin did a, 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 in a couple of speeches, he said something that stuck with me. Basically, a couple of times they said, we will cool the, the hotheads. If you look at that, he said that never, a number of times in, spe in speeches. But what he has basically said was this, and this is the way I interpret it, and this is kind of the way it was said, that he recognizes that we're transitioning to a multipolar world, that he recognizes that he has an irrational, unstable, dangerous enemy, and that he takes the responsibility to to get into that new multipolar world without these idiots blowing it all up, you know? And I believe if you, if the three of us can look at this and we know this, then Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin also know this. I believe in listening to them, I believe that they do have a level of empathy for other parts of the world, for Africa, for not just their countries. So I think maybe I'm wrong. I, I'll get you to comment on this, Carl. I think that Xi Jinping and um, Vladimir Putin understand the level of danger and that they feel that it is their responsibility to navigate the world through this dangerous period in a manner that doesn't get these hotheads to just freak out and push the button and blow us all up. I think they understand their responsibility. And I think the two of them are working together. To, now, that's nothing's guaranteed. They must defend themselves if attacked. But I don't think they'll be provoked because they understand that they're watching the last throes of a wounded, dying animal and that it's dangerous. Don't get too close to the animal, but you don't have to do anything. It's wounded. This empire is wounded and it's going to fall. And that they're using diplomacy worldwide and they're attacking it in a way that is subtle, which is they're going after U.S. dollar hegemony. They're setting up alternative economic systems so that they, they, they yank the hegemony of the dollar out from under the U.S. empire so it collapses in a different way rather than to have to meet them in a head-on military conflict. But So my point being, I think they recognize the danger of the situation. They want to get their people through it, and they want to get the world through to the other side, to that multipolar world, without triggering the crazies. You know, I, I agree. I think, you know, U.S. media often portray leaders of the countries that, that the U.S. find objectionable as irrational, as crazy. But I don't think Xi Jinping is as su a suicidal as the U.S. politicians. Right. I mean, Ch China is doing well right now. China is is on the, on the right track. Like, there's no point for China to get into a pointless war with U.S., to derail its current uh, march to our prosperity. I mean, that's what China is focusing on. It's, it's focusing on to to for the betterment of the Chinese people. They, 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 they that's why they they did not take the bait over the Nancy Pelosi visit, and I don't think they will take the bait over the McCarthy visit. I mean, the, the, that's why this, see the U.S. plan all hinge, hinge on China makes the first move, right? right. China by fire the first shot, but. Xi Jinping is not doing it. That's why these guys in, in Washington are, are getting desperate. They're, they're, they're start manufacturing lies and stories, trying to convince us this is really going to happen. But I, I don't think um, China will make a military move in 2025. Uh, I don't think it's going to make a move in 2027 because China is going to be stronger in 2030. <laughs> China is going to be much even stronger in 2035. Um, I mean, like right now, and the, the, the people who, who talk about U.S.-China war, the, the presumption is that U.S. maintained this overwhelming lead on China. But guess what? China, they are the manufacturing, they're the factory of the world. Who have the manufacturing base? You know, China, if they wanted to, they can crank out worship at a much faster rate than the United States. 
right? And and but 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 you know, China is building up its military. It's true. It's it's uh, because it needs to to have credible deterrent in in case U.S. tries something crazy. Uh, but 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 China has not. You know, it's it's not like I, like we already discussed. China is not devoting. Uh, uh, the, the same amount of the percentage of GDP that U.S. is devoting to the defense spending. China is not doing that. And, and but, but even so, currently, um, I don't think China, China is that much behind in U.S. in terms of military capabilities. I mean, look at the Navy ships. China has the most advanced missile, missile destroyer, the Type 55. And, and the, if you look at the U.S., uh, a U.S. planned uh, a missile destroyer. This they call the DDGX. If you look at the picture that they put out, it's almost exact carbon copy of the Chinese Type 55. But guess what? The the the, the Pentagon desire worship is that that process, the, the bidding process, has been pushed to 2030. <laughs> so while China already have the most advanced missile destroyer, mm-hmm. US is gonna wait another you know 10 years before you will have 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 its own. And by by then China will have more. And then China can can crank out worship at much, much faster rate than US. And and yes, China US still leads China in terms of uh aircraft carrier tonnage. Uh but then again China is not trying to project the power all, all over the world. <laughs> China is just trying to trying to keep peace in its own neighborhood. So so China does not need like 10 aircraft carrier group like the United States. You know, China just need to make sure its missiles can cover all the all the area from its shore. So the US aircraft carrier group cannot even come close. And and right now um yeah I, I would say even even when push come to a shove Without involving of nuclear weapons, I, I actually don't see how U.S. Navy can win a conventional warfare uh, around the area of Taiwan. I mean, if they're gonna go like a make a world war, they're gonna intercepting Chinese shippings, you know, in the Middle East. That that might be a different story. This is another reason why China is pushing for the Belt and Road Initiative because they understand the U.S. Navy never was quite open about Strait of Malacca being a choke point for the Chinese oil supply, you know, and they intend to choke it in the time of war. That's why China is building connectivity all across the world. So it's not just one single point that the U.S. Navy has to worry about. Now there's a, there's a, there's hundreds of thousands of ports that U.S., there's no way U.S. Navy can spread itself that that thin to, to cover all the points. And that's this is and China is winning in that in that in that um, in that front because China is offering money, China is offering expertise, China is building infrastructures. You know, when when US is saying, oh, this is all like a Chinese trap, but but it's actually not true because uh, uh, demonstratively not true because when China built a port on the east coast of Africa, yes, it's linking Africa with China, but it's a port. Anybody can use the port. You know, anybody can come in and trade with that nation. It's increasing global connectivity at a global level, right? This is not exclusive to China. So, so, so all that that and and this is why the Chinese overture has been much more welcome in the global south than United States. Because right now, U.S. only offer weapons. <laughs> we only offer weapons on our military bases. China, China is coming to offer infrastructure and 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 investment. So so guess what? The <laughs> I mean, other thing now, now why this is why they 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 have they're promoting this fear somehow China is lose somehow the West is losing Africa to China like Africa is the West property to begin with. I mean this is, I, yeah. So so to me, I, I I'm ranting, but 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 China is not in a hurry. China time. China is patient. China waited 70. No, China did not move to resolve Taiwan issue for 72 years. China can wait another 10 years and 15 years. This is time is on China's side. You know, every year China grows stronger. So it's the U.S. that's that's getting impatient. And, and we just have to survive this very dangerous next five, 10 years. To, hopefully these crazies don't try something like really, really crazy. Well, the other part of it is important is they're the U.S.'s number one trading partner. The U.S. to go to war would be total economic collapse and starvation. 
literally starvation because a lot of the things that we use to manufacture food, to distribute yeah. food, to produce food, things of that nature would disappear. They wouldn't be able to get parts. They wouldn't be able to keep things going. Our electrical grid, hardware that we use for the computers in our electrical grid comes from China. So for the U.S. to go to war with China, even if it didn't, if it stayed conventional, which the likelihood is the U.S. would, I think, it take a, a pretty bad beating to it to attack a another superpower. And you have to go 7,000 miles to their border to attack them. And they can fire missiles from their homeland and their own airspace. You ain't winning that one. But the bottom line is, if if the ship stopped tomorrow, that's it for the U.S. economy. It would be economic suicide immediately, but not just for the U.S. Also, for uh, look at uh, what's going on in, um, in even now in... Um, and in Europe, I was reading the other day, Mercedes Benz and BMW, one of them sells 38% of their cars in China, the other 40%. So right now the U.S. is starting to yank on the chain of um, of the, their European vassals saying, yeah, we might have to do some things against China. It would be total. They're in bad enough shape and they're, they're spiraling down. It would be immediate suicide, economic annihilation, immediate transformation within six months into third world countries were they to do that, which would also um, create um, uprisings. The countries would, the, the businesses would then turn on the politicians. The countries would become unstable and some of them would literally fall apart into disarray. So the U.S. is putting... Um, the Europeans in a position now, if they start trying, as they seem to be want to do, if they start trying to get Europe to sanction China, they're, they're going to create a level of instability in Europe that cannot be maintained. Uh, that definitely, definitely, because Germany, their largest energy source is Russia. U.S. already cut off, cut that off, cut that leg under from the German industry. Now, the Germans, Germany's largest export market is China. Now, now the, not only U.S. is going to take away the natural gas uh, supply line from, from Germany, they want Germany to, to, to close their, uh, you know, to, to voluntarily to, to, to shun their largest customer. I mean, yeah, that's, that, they will be committing economic suicide. That, that will just, it will just be over, game over. I mean, I, I can't even see how even as much subservient as the European elite are to the Washington interests, they're 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 willing to commit seppuku <laughs> for for us over this i mean this is just it was just crazy yeah, and the I, countries would literally fall into complete instability what is what is a country going to do when within a couple of months the industries close down the people don't have jobs the people don't have heating there's no money coming in and the country falls into dire and abject poverty over a period of six months at that point somewhere within that six months your government falls your country falls into violence and disarray and that well, would be all across europe well, I want to ask, I mean, I, I know Garland, uh, it's it's getting quite late for you, but I wanted to uh, pose one more question that, or, or, or maybe you can comment on, on this comment uh, that I have based on what you two are saying, because I was just thinking as you both were talking, and I've been saying this on the channel for quite some time that, you know, wars are not just one on the battlefield, whether it's a cold war, a hot war. They're not really just one on the battlefield. I think we're finding when it comes to Russia and Ukraine that the the, the proxy war there. I mean, you have a situation now where Russia is going to grow at a faster pace than Germany. As you said, Carl, Germany's uh, primary principal energy supplier has been uh, cut off from Germany. And, and that's because of the United States. And then you have a situation, as you were saying, Gar, what happens if China, if there is this deco a forced decoupling because of a, a, an unhinged neocon driven war with China? Well, that is the collapse of the entire global economy and the U.S. and the collective West will be hurt the most because Russia was preparing for the conflict in Ukraine this whole time, this whole last nine years plus preparing for this. China has been preparing I mean, we could argue that the normalization of relations with the United States gave China a lot of time to prepare the way to integrate itself into the world economy and to be able to do set up a terrain for itself so that it does have insulation when 
the bottom falls out. And it is falling out, not because of China, but because the United States now views China's 6% year-on-year growth, I think it's been over the last five years. Uh, it, it views its possibility of uh, surpassing the United States in GDP terms in the next five to 10 years. It also views things like investing all this money, not just in the military, to defend yourself. Zhao Bo, who uh, works for Tsinghua University now, but he was a senior colonel in the PLA's Air Force. He said, China doesn't build a military to like go and you know expand elsewhere. It's literally just building a military to defend its national interests in its own region. That's what it's doing. That's what it's been doing. That's all it spends on. The, that's the only reason why it has it increased in the military, anything like he said that at Munich at the Munich Security Conference. But as China is doing that, preparing to defend itself, it also has been alleviating poverty, stabilizing the food supply, uh, uh, creating millions upon millions of jobs in the cities, uh, uh, reducing uh, poverty, eliminating poverty in the countryside, connecting the two together, uh, countryside and the cities. It's been doing high speed rail. Uh, renewable energy leading in that way. I think uh, this year China was able to reach the point where every house in China it can be or is powered by renewable energy at this point. So they're doing things to stabilize Chinese society and to increase the standard of living of people's livelihood. And that only puts China in a better position, not just internally to prepare for war, but also it shows the world as China reaches out with its Belt and Road Initiative and all of its various multilateral and, and, and multipolar uh, formations as it reaches out and says, hey, do you want to do this kind of trade? Other countries look and say, absolutely. And so you have the rest of the world, uh, at least the, the, the global majority in the global south, which are saying if, if you thought that Africa, Latin America and countries in that region are not going, West Asia are not going to go along with a war on Russia. Well, they're definitely not going to go along with the war on China. I want to get your uh, take on that before we end the interview portion of this. Okay. I, I, I'll just put in my two cents real quick. Um, <clears throat> the trade figures for China in 2022, China has <clears throat> China trade with the rest of the world uh, to the tune of $6.2 trillion. Among those, 700 billion was with U.S., so it's a little bit more than 10 percent. But people in U.S. thinks oh, all <laughs> people th in U.S. actually think that you, it's United States that made China wealthy, that developed China through trade. They over exaggerate the importance of United States, uh, you know, in terms of China. Like I say, it, the U.S. trade is important to China. You know, 700 million billion is not a chump change, but it's only t about 10 percent of that 6.2 trillion. That the, the rest of five trillion dollars is with the rest of the world. And, and like you said, Danny, the rest of the world currently is not signing on with this uh, U.S. sanction, you know, U.S. led war against Russia. They they have no reason to sign up on with the U.S. war against China because it's 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 U.S. will be only cutting itself off from the world trade. I mean, the U.S. will be be end up only trading with its own vassal states in Europe and maybe Japan and 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 and, and uh, you know Australia, etc. Whereas the rest of the world will trade among themselves and they will be perfectly fine with that. That's that's my two cents. Yeah, I'm, I'm with him. And uh, the bottom line is the United States is not the world anymore. The United States doesn't, as, as Carl was saying, doesn't have the percentage of trade worldwide, doesn't have the authority and the power it used to have. And the the, um, the 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 leaders of this country at this time are having a tremendous amount of trouble dealing with that. They don't know how to navigate um, the geopolitical system without simply being able to completely dominate it. So they're making themselves look like fools. And at some point, they're going to smash head on into reality. And I think it's going to be in the EU. I think the Europeans are vassals, yes, but they can only go but so far until the leaders, until the the quislings, the um, traitors, uh, let's face it, that's what they are, that are leading the, uh, the governments of Europe um, run so far afoul 
of the interest of their population that they face internal uprisings to a level that they cannot con that they can no longer contain and they have to respond to. At that point, it's over for the U.S. because without the EU block, I mean, they've deliberately wiped out the the, the block, the EU economically. But once that block has to back away from them and has to say the truthfully face the reality that their security needs do not align with the U.S. empire, then the U.S. empires will be left by itself. And somewhere in that period of time is when dollar hegemony, hegemony really starts to fall. See, that's the other part. Um, China and, and Russia don't really have to act kinetically because in building the SCO, they now have the SCO and BRICS, and they now have um, market insistence, where you have countries all over the world begging, when can we join the uh, Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization? When can we get in BRICS? Huge countries begging to get in. As they get in, as new currencies start to arise with some of these organizations, they don't have to have a kinetic war with the U.S. These kinds of things are going to take care of itself. As the U.S. Um, dollar loses hegemony, the U.S. is no longer going to be able to finance this international war machine. So they don't have to fight it. They, they can just simply continue to work to pull the foundation of it out from under it, and it'll fall on its own. Yeah, I mean... That though these are all great points. I, I I mean there's there is no there's no other way to look at it in my opinion. It's so easy. I think if you just if you're just getting alerts on your phones and you're listening to what the Western mainstream media, U.S. mainstream media, is saying, makes it feel like everything is just fine. Everything is just fine. Going going a little that shit about uh, cranes, but everything's fine. And, you know, uh, ignoring, completely ignoring one of the biggest bombshell reports maybe in the last generation from Seymour Hersh and Dorsey, but everything is just fine. You know, Ukraine can't stop sending <laughs> thousands of people, 16 year olds and all sorts of uh, people out into Bakhmut to get slaughtered. Like, like it's everything is just fine. Everything is going exactly as planned. And, and I think what you two have outlined is that actually things are not going as planned and that that is really what's actually shaping geopolitics right now not some just you know unhinged plot by the neocon foreign policy establishment for domination and and you know maximal profits for their um uh, you know from their donor class no that's that's a hundred percent true but it's being undergirded by everything that you both were saying this decline in the United States' stature and its overall system. And then, Garland, you mentioned this more than a few times, de-dollarization. You have Russia's market now, I think, almost completely replacing the dollar and the euro. I think 40% of Russia's overall trade volume and uh, even its internal market is is trading now in yuan and using Iraq. it as a currency yeah iraq, iraq is, oh, egypt in yuan. egypt is also going to so this is a global phenomenon as what well, you know and so i don't know if you two have any final words that you want to uh get out there before we head out for this before you all head out i'm going to stay on for a couple more minutes so folks stick around but i'll kick it on to you uh carl and then garland if you want to i just like to thank you danny for provide this platform for me to vent regularly <laughs> <laughs> i feel like living in this age i kind of needed that so thank you thank you yeah yeah no <laughs> i thought i thought of you recently i was like gotta get carl on because i can't stop i can't stop getting i can't i need to talk to somebody about this flurry of in, misinformation that we're getting of late especially the last week so thank you carl yeah. Well, and I'll thank say you, this, Garland, you know, for your, for I your know humor it's and parody. That's <laughs> what we need at, at this time. We need satire, yeah. parody. Um, uh, uh, we, at least we can get a good laugh out of this <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous situation we're in. Yes, thank you. And um, I, I say this um, with all sincerity. And, you know, it's a time when people are afraid, people are on edge. Are we all going to die? You know, those questions are, is it, is it all over? I, I, I really believe, as I said, if, if the three of us are sitting here understanding the danger of these neocons, then 
um, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin and their alliances clearly understand it as well as we do, if not better, because they have a lot more intelligence. And I believe they are working to navigate this in a way that doesn't end mankind, that they understand that China's not just going to go uh, fly, throwing missiles all over the place. Russia people have been angry at Putin. Something would happen. They'd say, why didn't he respond more far forcefully? Why didn't I think he? Un they both understand we're dealing with lunatics here. We have to be measured in our actions. We have to, you know, as they say, measure a thousand times, cut once. And I think that's what we're going to see. And I think we're going to see. I'm looking forward to the meeting between Xi Jinping and it may be and, and Vladimir Putin. It may be nothing. It may be a military alliance, but I think something will come of it. Um, uh, um, and I think I have faith that we will get through this. Um, this is the first nuclear. Look, this isn't the first empire to crash, but it's the first nuclear empire to crash. So it's a dangerous period, but I have faith that we will get through it, that they just both both know, don't fire first on these idiots. Keep it slow and deal with this thing. And, and I think the weak point is in the European vassals. That's the weak point of the U.S. Yeah. empire right there. That's going to fall first. When that falls, then they don't have any support to continue the things that they're doing. As much as they're beating up on their vassals, they have to have them. That gives them credibility. Yeah. That gives them people in the U.N. and all of that. Once that starts to deteriorate, and it's already started to, then the U.S. The US empire's ability to maintain some modicum of credibility, which they've mostly lost worldwide, just completely evaporates. No, they say it all the time, too. They say this is we're united. We're united. I mean, the, Biden has to say that. And so does the rest of the collective West. I, I mean, that's why they don't like Trump, because Trump won't say that. And that's actually a real big stain because it does prevent certain things from happening, because when the public relations aren't right, then the empire is not right. But um, with that said, guys, thanks so much for joining me. I'm going to stick around, everyone, for another 15, 20 minutes or so, um, announcements and shout outs and things like that. So thanks so much. Good night, Garland, and have a good rest of your morning, afternoon, uh, Carl. Thanks, guys. Good night. Bye. Good night. All right, everyone. That was a great stream. Thanks so much uh, uh, for joining the interview. I'm not, I'm going to stay on for another 15, 20 minutes. I'm, I'm curious. I, I kind of want to do a story. But I'm a little tired. I don't know if I can do a story tonight. Uh, we just had a wide ranging conversation. So uh, we have about a thousand people on. Keep hitting that like button before you leave. Um, stick around. I'm going to do shout outs. If you have any questions, I can do that. I think I'm going to leave the story for another time. Um, announcement. So uh, after today, I'm probably going to take the next at least two days off. I may come on third Friday or Saturday night. Those are two nights that I can come on. And then, um, uh, you know, the next week, I think there will be lots of time as well for live stream. So uh, that's when I'll be on next. And I just want to actually, let me put out something as I go through these super chats. I want to put out something. I have a lot of guests on this channel, but I don't want you to get it confused. I have, I know you all love the guests, but this is my channel. And I just want to let you know that I conduct interviews in a particular way, okay, thank you so much, Esoteric Teachings. But you are completely right. We need a third party now. And we are run by warmongers here in the United States. I just want to say that there are certain guests that can talk and that can move through conversations. Um, I can't prepare. Like if There are some guests that like to give short statements. And then we have more of a conversation. So I see, you know, there are more than a few folks who comment saying, stop talking so much, Danny. I just want you to know that generally my interviews, you'll always get 60, 70 percent the person in 20 to 30 from me, sometimes even less from me, depending on the guest. But some guests like to have conversations. Some guests do better when there's a back and forth. And so, you know, I hope that you all enjoy my commentary because I also do a lot of solo streams on here that I hope you all will come to. So I try to balance it out. February was a busy month with guests because it was the anniversary month of the Ukraine proxy war. But generally, there are going to be a few guests on this program. And I love having guests. I think it adds a lot. Collaboration is amazing. 
And I feel like I have a pretty good network of people that are willing to contribute to this work and take their time out. Thank you all of Six for the super sticker. It's great. I love it. I love Garland, Carl, Scott Ritter, Brian Berletic. I love, you know, all the folks that I've had on here. Great people. Margaret Kimberly, everybody. Great people. You're never going to find a person on here that you're going to go, uh, why are you talking to this opportunist or warmonger or, you know, are you just a great bro? I mean, none of that. This is all about geopolitics, analyzing the situation, getting the information we need out, providing resources for that. This is independent work. Thank you, David Falconer. I will be telling it like it is. But just know that that's sometimes how it goes. So, you know, I understand that sometimes people have this idea of interviews as just being, I'm here as a reporter or a journalist asking a question to the person I'm interviewing. That's not, this is, you know, this is, this is, this, I conduct this channel a little differently because I myself am an analyst. Right, so we're collaborating. We're going back and forth. I will never dominate the conversation, and I hope that you all uh, feel the same way and have uh, gleaned from that. I just want to put that out there because I've gotten quite a few YouTube comments of late, which I find a little shocking. And sometimes I clip up the interviews, and so sometimes my maybe my statement was a little long in the clip, and I've clipped it off, and maybe it seems like it's shorter. You know, I'm talking too much, but just know that if you're following this channel, you're coming to the stream, you're, you're listening to these interviews and conversations, that, that I, I believe that they are being conducted professionally, and I hope for all of you, they're being done effectively so that you, know, you all get something from it and can share with folks so they can get something from it. That's, that's all I care about. And I care about is this, is this work making an impact for you all who are watching, and is it Am I doing my job? You know, am I doing my job of informing, of educating, of analyzing, of explaining, and giving you all the information and analysis that you feel like is, is useful in this very dangerous moment for all of us and this moment where we need more now than ever independent voices, movements, people who are willing to speak out and speak up against the empire. So, that's I just want to put that out there as I'm thinking, folks. Uh, thanks to all the members, Patreon community. Uh, I, I, I think someone from Patreon, I want to apologize. Uh, if you sent me an email, a message on Patreon, I think it got lost. So sorry about that. But um, I usually try to ask questions of guests I didn't have any today. But, um, you know, that's one perk. If you want to become a Patreon member and support this show, go to Patreon.com. Complex Danny High Fong subscribes annually, and you can suggest guests, ask questions of guests, and you can do a whole lot more. There are a whole lot more perks where that comes from. And then, you know, there's other options as well. There's Substack and link in the description where I want you all to get on the free newsletter, if anything, but you can subscribe annually there. Also, you can find one time options in the link in the description as well. And um, you can become a YouTube member here. We have a great community of people, uh, uh, some of which who are coming to every stream, and I give them shout-outs when I'm able to. Now we have Mobius Zero uh, with a great super chat. Thank you so much. You know what's worse? The PLA is the most underestimated military on the planet. Some people think the Japan alone can be China in a day in the U.S. in seven hours. That's absolutely preposterous. And I was going to cover a story, actually, where the U.S. Army General of the Pacific admitted as much that the United States has massive disadvantages that is going to be trouble for China. And they're all saying it. They're all saying they're not ready for China. And they're not. The United States is not. So it is massively underestimated. It, there's the geographic factor, the people factor, the military factor. Uh, so many factors that put the United States in complete disadvantage to China. But it's not just that. It's also militarily. China can do things because of the way its military is structured that the United States can't. And if you think that trying to um, offensively attack China is smart on the part of the U.S., well, you know, F around and find out, really. That's, that's, that's the situation. Mess, mess, you know, that's what Scott Ritter said on this show. Mess around and find out, really. Try it. Um, I see some super chats at the bottom. I'm going to get to you all when I'm done with the top. So, David, thanks so much, DJ. Gentlemen, please interview Eric Lee. Um, he's from Shanghai, and he talks about Chinese geopolitics and history. I think I know who you're talking about. 
Eric, I think, is a blue capitalist. He talks a lot about Chinese history, Chinese politics, Chinese economy, geopolitics. He's great. I don't know how to contact him. I think I've thought of this or tried. If anyone has any idea, please do put me some kind of message anywhere. Um, that would be great. Thank you so much, Dean Jones. I'm going to get to the folks at the bottom soon. Thanks so much. Um, let's see. All right, that's it. All right, so I'm going to get to the bottom now. Uh, Karina, thank you for telling the truth, Danny. US, USAers are the most highly propagated candidate people on the planet. Thank you so much for the that, Karina. Agreed. Uh, everyone follow anti Conquista. If you're not already, you can find them on social media, Twitter, Instagram. They do some great work. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're 100% right. Um, the United States is the most propagated place on the planet. And of course, the people who live here have the unfortunate reality of being the victims and targets of that. CJ said, books you might recommend a better understanding of geopolitics. Top five favorite books, fiction and nonfiction. Thank you for making this content. Oh my gosh. Now that's a question. Now that's a stream in and of itself. So I don't know if I can just name that off the top of my head. Better understanding of geopolitics. Wow. You know, a lot of my geopolitical understanding doesn't come from books because there are not that many. But, you know, there's some great books on China, um, you know, uh, uh, find Jenny Clegg's book on um, um, China. It's great. Okay. Uh, it's written a lot of books. And one of them is, where is this? On multipolarity. I can't, I don't have it up. Um, I can't really pull it from my shelf either. Um, so look up Jenny Clegg, C-L-E-G-G. -G. Uh, she has some great books. Um, I just want to look up the book for what I'm talking about. Um, let's see. Yeah, she has some great books. But uh, one of them is China's Global Strategy Towards a Multipolar World. That's a great book if you want to understand. It's kind of old. Uh, if you want to know China and Africa, you can read The Dragon's Gift by uh, Deborah Bagam. Um, so you can read that. That's a great book on China and Africa. With Russia, it's a bit tougher. I'm not so sure. You know, I think my colleague has a great book on all the Soviet Union called um, The End of the Beginning. Um, and you can, you know, definitely search that. Carlos Martinez, The End of the Beginning. He has a great book. Uh, Leftward Press published it. And that's what's called the Soviet Union, the the Soviet Union. It goes over a lot of the history of how that happened. And it's so important to note and understand. Or after that, you know, I'm not going to recommend any books. I'm just going to say, read Vladimir Putin's speeches. And if you read his speeches, you can understand what happened after the Soviet Union pretty well. Um, you know, because it, 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 in terms of shock therapy and everything that happened to Russia following that period. So I'm just going to put that out there. Um, and uh, top five favorite books, fiction and nonfiction. Oh, gosh. Uh, I don't read, I'm going to be honest here. I can't even answer the fiction question because I am kind of dogmatic a bit. And it's not because I, in my choice, it's just that I live in this um, really intensely, uh, really intense period in the U.S. where I just don't have the time to be reading all the things that I want to read, unfortunately. So, um, I don't even have a nonfiction recommendation off the top of my head because it's been a while since I've gone into that. Now, in terms of not, I mean, a fiction book, but in terms of nonfiction, you're asking really tough questions here. I mean, at one point it was George Jackson's Blood in My Eye, but I think that has changed. One of my recent favorites is Eldest Son by Han Su Kim, a Chinese author. She uh, did a whole biography on Joe and Lai. Uh, the Chinese premier, um, incredible revolutionary. She goes over like all of Chinese history up until 1978 through the biographical lens of Zhou Enlai's life, and it is really very um, detailed. And you get a really good grasp of Chinese history. So that's one of my favorite books of late that I've read. Um, so, so I'll just I'll just leave it there. But thank you so much for that question. Um, and we have Sandy with the super sticker. Incredible. Thanks so much for that generosity. 
Notary says, Dan, you're doing fantastic. You're providing so much info. This is all essential public consciousness. Thank you so much for that generosity, Notary. I appreciate you coming here. Um, something wrong with my mic. Don't tell me I'm already. I'm having audio issues already. <laughs> um, let's see. The audio is choppy, huh? Hmm. Let's hope not. Okay. Yeah, Lee Fong on Danny. I think he works and he used to work for Intercept. Oh, Lee, Lee Fang, you mean? Uh, CJ. Okay, so. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, so no way I'm going to get your comments out. Sorry. All right, everyone. Uh, I hope the audio was good during the stream. Some people are having problems with sound now. I did have to charge this, and sometimes that makes things go bad. I have to charge my laptop while I'm doing this stuff. So give me a sound check at the end of the stream. I hope there was nothing wrong during the stream. Um, the audio is messed up, huh? What is happening? Huh. I hope I wasn't having these issues. What? Give me, okay, only at the end. What is happening? Well, I guess it's a good time to sign off, as other people said. I haven't been able to hear anything come out of my headphones. So that's also probably <laughs> um, But anyway, it was great. Good time to sign off. Thanks so much. Sorry for the audio issues at the end here. Um, all right, something happened. I'm not going to reload this. Good night. Have a good night. I'll see you guys probably later in the week. Okay. All right. Take care. Good night.